Hi there, and welcome back to Station Road. And this is now part three of uh, the we uh, baseboard section rebuild. Now, I was hoping to actually squeeze the remainder of this into part three, but uh, part three started getting rather large, so it is actually going to be part three and part four. And just as I've now started recording the next door neighbor has got their lawnmower out and started mowing so uh, bear with me on that one that uh, is another one of the disadvantages of lockdown is all of a sudden the neighborhood becomes a lot lot noisier So um, this is sort of moving on from part two in terms of this section rebuild that uh, I have behind me. And we now have pretty much the, um, as we know, the, the pub and the construction site um, more or less complete. And the first thing I'll just move on to um, shortly will be um, the issue about how I secure these sort of little dioramas down onto the layout and there was discussions about screws and magnets and all sorts of things um, and then uh, I've gone down the magnet route and I've actually just used a magnet that, uh, or some magnets that I had available but they're not the super powerful neo magnets uh, what, what um, coming what exactly what they're called but um, nonetheless uh, it has actually worked quite well. So without further ado, we'll get into this and take this uh, a few steps further. So um, as you saw in part two, here is the uh, completed pub slash construction site diorama. Um, now, in terms of um, securing this to the baseball, because as previously discussed in part two, there were issues about the sort of the, the flexibility of the um, MDF um, and it's sitting nice and flush and flat on the baseboard and particularly sort of down this end because it's quite thin. Um, interestingly enough it's flattened itself out now because I've actually had it sitting down on the baseboard for a few days so it's kind of corrected itself now but nonetheless um, I put together for this um, for securing this particular section um, a magnet uh, down at the scene. So essentially if we just flip this over, um, what I've actually done is I've recessed into the underside of the MDF a very thin piece of metal. So um, that sits flush if we uh, mm. sort of look at it on the angle, um, it actually sits flush in there so it doesn't give a raised section of the pavement um, and that then sits and resides over a magnet that I have recessed into the baseboard so I'll show you that in a minute. Uh, one other thing that I've actually done while I've actually got this uh, on its side is this is what I have sorted out for the wiring on the uh, internal lights for the pub so basically I've just put in a uh, circuit board which um, has positive and negative strips and um, essentially just sort of rather randomly <laughs> soldered in all the wiring. So um, if we head over to the baseboard what I've done here is um, inserted just a small round magnet and uh, so I drilled out a bit of a hole and that is now permanently glued in there. So this is not one of those super powerful magnets, um, but uh, nonetheless it, uh, it still is strong enough to actually um, anchor down this panel. So um, we'll just, uh, I'll see if I can do this uh, one handed and um, we'll pop this base back in and we've got to get these wires go down into there. and get that positioned in by the factory and that's it in position so um, 
if we're looking at the the magnet um, that just anchors that down and um, and that has worked really well so at this stage I only have a magnet down at this end um, because this was the the main sort of problem area um, the uh, the diorama is actually settled down a bit anyway so it's now starting to be uh, look quite flush but I will be doing a magnet down in this corner somewhere near this um, outdoor table um, possibly in here somewhere but I am going to use those super powerful magnets because um, basically I can put one there that is very very small and um, it'll anchor that down uh, in terms of um, other areas and I'll, this will come up in either part, this part or possibly part four for the uh, the actual station itself I think this might actually come into part four where I, I'll figure out a way of anchoring down the platforms as well um, and um, that won't be magnetic so that that I've um, actually gone a, down a different route uh, to deal with that but uh, anyway uh, we'll get on with this video um, you are currently seeing this view in the future so to speak so we'll go back in time and uh, look at the continuation of this uh, rebuild so the first thing I'm doing before I stick down the paving sheets is I'm just going around the edges uh, of the paving with a acrylic paint that's actually a very good match and I'll show you this once I've finished painting this so I'll just uh, get around these edges the um, the paint that I'm using around the edges uh, is just a Humber acrylic um, rail color so uh, it is RC413 and it's actually a very good match to our Metcalf paving sheet and in terms of the color so it was just easier for me to do all the edges first um, and then once this is all dry then we can actually uh, start putting down this uh, paving sheet and then once that's glued down and dry I then just will go over with a much finer brush and just to paint the white edge of the card so uh, we get a nice flush even surface all right so I've cut out different sections of paving to make up the coverage of the, the whole paving area so you know we've got various different bits because it is unusually shaped so um, it took a little bit of working out um, particularly to um, essentially get the, the paving slabs lined up correctly so we're going to glue all this down now. Now I just use this um, the Gorilla PVA glue and it works perfectly well. Um, so we'll go ahead and get these paving sections stuck down. just going to do these sort of a section at a time another useful tool if you're into um, card kits and um, or any any kind of printed material that you're gluing down uh, one of these rollers is really good it's particularly good if you're doing the um, downloadable um, kits where you're printing out brick paper or brick textures or stone textures um, just on simply on you know on your your printer paper stock um, and then you want to go and stick that onto some card like this is the best way this is the best tool for getting a nice flat even surface Right, there we go. That is the uh, 
paving down. So what we might do is we'll just uh, temporarily pop the station back on there and just see how this looks. Oops, bump the camera. So as we can see, you know, it's um, starting to take shape. Uh, so we're just going to let that dry for a wee while and um, in the meantime I'm going to head off and I'm going to try and actually resurrect the steps uh, that used to be here and here from what is remains of the old um, baseboard. I'm going to see if I can actually recycle those uh, to save me having to remake them. So I managed to uh, prize these wee steps off the previous baseboard which uh, I hadn't actually thrown out yet. Um, I mean they're a little bit rough but um, I think once I'll, I'll fix them down here but um, once they're weathered and I might sort of repaint the steps in there. Um, a little bit of weeds growing up along the edges here and so forth I'm sure we can uh, disguise that. Um, but uh, what we're going to do now is I'm just going to go back over um, around the edges of the uh, paving with a um, much finer paintbrush because there's a bit of white card in here around these inside edges so I just want to touch up in there before I actually glue in the next strip because that white might end up showing um, in any potential gap from um, the edging that I'm going to put around here. So we're just going to quickly do that now and um, the next stage I think we're going to do a little bit of um, weathering so just simply weathering around the edges of the pavement um, to sort of well essentially give it that sort of worn look um, and uh, I'll show you a few secrets or tips that I use and some materials for uh, doing that. Here we go, so that's the edges touched up and we'll let that dry. In the meantime I might, uh, I'll glue these two down because then I can work the weathering um, in conjunction with the pavement at the same time. So, um, so it kind of looks similar. Um, and I'll use same similar sort of weathering techniques that I've used actually around through the platform. As well. So uh, there's this um, wee strips here which uh, come as part of the Metcalf paving sheets um, and this is just for the edging. So um, I mean I could individually cut out each uh, paver and stick it around but um, I'm just basically kind of forcing it around the edges and uh, we're going to use our trusty zap glue which uh, is very good. And there we go, a bit of edging. Um, yeah, I just sort of think, um, you know, I mean, I could, I could have easily just not bothered and let the let the uh, stonework continue the edges, which, incidentally, I have done on some previous stuff um, over in the town area. And, yeah, I mean, it looks okay, but this sort of, it does look even better. It just sort of really does improve it in terms of the uh, appearance. So these are my... Uh, homemade weathering powders and 
a bit later on in this video I'll show you how I go about making these and also um, you know we'll, we'll do another price comparison because although I haven't actually done a price comparison it would be interesting to actually see whether it's um, any more competitive than buying uh, pre-made weathering powders. Uh, I use to go with that a couple of uh, very very soft um, fine bristly bristly brushes right so um, I'm going to move this station out of the way because it doesn't really need to be weathered anymore because as you can see um, can we get in the shot you can see that there's sort of bits of weathering. I probably, I've weathered around this base unit piece, but I actually do need to actually come up and actually weather in the sort of upper areas here, but uh, I'll do that at a different stage. Now you've got to be careful with this stuff because it does actually go everywhere. Um, it's, um, it's super fine. And uh, yeah, but um, I'll go with the bigger brush first and essentially just dab it in. Um, you know, there's quite a big clump uh, on the end of that brush now and I usually tap a few times tap a little bit out and incidentally also almost forgot so I like to have a, a spare bit of material that is either exactly the same or very similar to the uh, substrate or material that you're actually applying the, the uh, powdering to so I've just grabbed this this little off cut of the stuff and uh, because essentially what I want to do is actually just get a gauge for the density of, of the, uh, the powder and uh, of course the other thing too is that we're working on a level surface so I can't I can't actually turn it sort of um, on its side or, or anything like that um, to get any excess off so it's sort of, um, it's, it might be a little bit more tricky on this. I'm certainly going to be probably using less rather than more uh, because that's got far too much on it. See, that's ridiculous, far too much. So um, it's going to need very light, whoops, very light dusting indeed. And, um, and I usually sort of start and just go around some edges. And you know you can blend it with a little bit with your finger, and of course it comes off in your in your finger. thing too is that um, if you um, feel that you've overdone it uh, you can actually use a rubber to actually tone it back Right, okay, um, I think that'll do for the weathering and uh, I'll um, clean up this piggy mess and uh, come back shortly. Right, so here we have it. Um, now I'll put the station just temporarily in position and I've also actually popped uh, the uh, previous part one and two uh, construction for well the pub slash construction site scene as well so you know the two of them side by side straddling the street it's now starting to take shape so the next 
we part that I'm going to tackle is um, this sort of slight kind of hill and embankment uh, which was on the original section of this baseboard and um, I'm kind of going to recreate it a little bit but uh, at the same time actually kind of improve the contours uh, so once again I'm using just this um, kind of dense foam and um, basically it's come down to off cuts hence why there's uh, uh, multiple small little bits to uh, put this all together and um, we'll see how it goes I'm going to use to glue this together I'm using uh, a product called the liquid nails sallies I'm not sure whether this is available available um, globally I'm, I'm guessing it must be um, but it's fast grab it's sort of pretty much I can start carving it within 24 hours and then it's permanently fixed now the apparently the the good thing about this is um, it will work with styrene foam because as we know certain glues will actually melt styrene foam um, I could use PVA but PVA I've previous experience has shown me that um, it does work when it eventually dries and um, PVA and polystyrene for some reason it just takes forever to dry um, so and I think it's just simply the fact that it's very difficult to to air dry um, because of the uh, nature of the polystyrene Right, so there we have it. So um, that's all stuck together. So we'll just leave that now. So as promised, I thought I'd show you a quick segment on weathering powders and how I go about making my own. Now, as we all know, you can buy weathering powders, weathering powders, um, pre-made obviously. And for example, I do have one here, which is a humble uh, weathering powder weathering powder I think it's a rust um, yeah rust color and uh, I haven't actually I, well, I might have used a little bit of this but um, you know for a small little jar of this that is ten dollars so um, you know it's a, it's a bit pricey but then I guess I mean a small amount of weathering powder goes a long way so um, so I guess at the end of the day, it's probably much of a muchness, but uh, yeah, $10 for that, uh, well, roughly about five pounds, um, I'm guessing, over in the UK uh, for one of these. Now, what I use, and as, as I mentioned in, earlier in the video, is um, I use chalk pastels, um, or soft pastels, as they're sometimes known. So this is not the oil pastels, but this is the chalk pastels. Um, which um which you would find in um, chalk drawing for 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 artists and being being an artist um, many many moons ago um i use chalk pastels actually quite a lot um i i do actually quite like the medium but um this here is uh, and i'll put a link for this in a description um because i'm pretty sure you can probably get this um you know around the world um as a set of uh, 12 pastels now I've, I've, I've actually jumbled this up because um, it, it's um, essentially the set is called earth tones um, and um, it has some other ones in it so you know I've, I've bought multiple sets of these and I actually have some more coming um, that I purchased as well and they're just sticks um, of chalk now this whole set is $10 so $10 for that or $10 for um, a whole range 
of um, weathering powders. So, you know, these would be, you know, roughly, yeah, five pound for, for 12, 12 different colours. Uh, so this is actually two sets that I've combined into one because I've already gone ahead and ground up quite a few pastels to make up some powders and as I mentioned um, I do have my favorites which tend to be those two there and then of course I found my black uh, so that is um, the the three main powders that I actually use and you can see I often use the black because it's getting very empty so I've got a couple of um, pastels here and the, these interestingly these ones here um, I think they're from from the set, but um, the local stationery shop that um, where I buy these, um, they actually had just a whole box full of loose pastels, and I'm assuming what they did is they actually they obviously had a whole lot of broken stock, and um, and they just simply gone in and picked out all the what all the um, individual pastels that were still intact in one piece and just heaved them into this big box and they were selling these off for ridiculously cheap price you know we're only talking a couple of cents um, um, per stick so of course I grabbed all the all the basically the earth tone ones um, so there's these browns and so forth here so um, so anyway these are the pastels now the thing is this makes a huge mess um, unfortunately but then all um, sort of weathering powders do and um, what I actually use and I've got this here it's not on a very long cord but um, I picked this up second hand this is a very very cheap uh, coffee grinder and um, oh god I, I you know might have paid five dollars for it um, on an auction website and um, you know it still goes it's nothing nothing wrong with it um, and of course I certainly wouldn't be blending my coffee in it any longer but um, but this is what I use so um, we'll give this a go now this is going to make a huge noise uh, as they do so uh, we'll pop some uh, pastels in here and I usually just bust them up a little bit so they're not quite so chunky and we'll just pop them in here and yep so that's uh, what have I put in there I put in four sticks um, effectively that's got four sticks in it so what's that work out um, you know because we're going to do a price comparison so we'll work that out so that's one third um, of uh, a packet of these essentially um, so uh, what are we looking at we're bit, well three three to four dollars worth of um, pastels that we've we've just um, chucked in this uh, uh, coffee grinder so we'll pop lid on that right ready for it this is going to make a lot of noise bit of a shake around just to make sure that we've got it all now it will be you have to be careful getting the lid off this because you know it does actually plume out um, so that's our that'll need a bit of a clean and as you can see it, um, it can be quite messy and I can actually see the dust flying around and floating around here um, I should probably be wearing a mask um, because otherwise you're going to be blowing brown snot so what I do here is I just simply tip this into this you know I've just got a plastic tray um, and we'll just tip it into that And there we have it. So um, that is that's basically roughly about three three to four dollars worth of weathering powder. Um, and then this wee bottle here next to it, nine dollars. So I would say, I mean, this is at a real guess, but I would say I've made possibly three, two to three. Of these an equivalent so maybe $30 um, worth of weathering powder for three to four 
dollars. But um, that is essentially my weathering powders. And um, as I mentioned, I'll put a link up um, for this, these particular pastels um, because they make a, um, a set of pastels because there's different sets. So you can actually get a gray, gray tone set. Um, you can get an earth tone set. And then I think you can get just simply like primary colors. Um, so the earth tone set is actually really good because you basically, you could actually use all the colors in it um, as, as weathering powders because some of these other tones in here um, work quite well in rust colors. And then these lighter colors like the yellows and so forth um, in pollen and, uh, you know, uh, foliage type situation so um yeah it's it's brilliant so um so that's that i will go and get myself cleaned up now right so um we'll stop the um part three here i think because um it is going to get very long uh i have actually started recording well part four thinking it would actually be part of part three um but um it is actually turning into quite a lengthy uh, video. So, um, but none to say it is packed full of hopefully useful information. Uh, so um, yeah, uh, going back to the weathering powders, I've now put uh, what we just ground up just before into one of these containers. And as you can see, um, the quantity is um, considerably different. Um, I haven't measured it, I haven't weighed it, I'm, I'm not going that far, but um, but uh, as, as I mentioned before, um, technically, in a way, this is $3.33 worth of um, weathering powder um, in this uh, plastic container, and this is $10 of weathering powder. So, um, you know, the, the difference is quite staggering. I, I, you know, and in terms of the actual, um, you know, application of it, there's very little difference um, in, in how how these um, these two powders, like the professional powder and the homemade powder, there's very little difference in, in how it actually behaves and how it actually applies to surfaces. Um, it almost makes me wonder whether um, Humbrol or any other you know professional weathering powder is actually made of ground up chalk pastel. So um, yeah, it's um, it's quite interesting. So um, well, um, as I said, we'll we'll stop it there. Um, um, and uh, part four will actually be coming out uh, a lot sooner. So um, the aim was that I was meant to get this video out last weekend, but it's just sort of kind of, um, you know, extended and extended more and more. So um, I'll leave it there. And um, once again, uh, everyone, you know, take care of yourselves, stay safe, um, you know, stay at home. And uh, I will see you next time. Bye for now.